Bari. Uh, I am the director of a small grassroots San Francisco based organization called Seed the Commons. Um, and so I'm going to speak a little bit about the promotion of veganic farming, um, what we do in that respect, and why it's something that's so new, so to speak, um, in the food movement. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead. All right. So I think many of people who attend Swan Not Oil are already on board with our vision of what the problem is with our environment, what the problem is with our food system, why food systems need to be changed to address um, the climate crisis. So basically, the way we perceive a lot of the social and environmental issues of today is that corporate takeover of natural resources are basically a mechanism of present day colonization. And our food systems are central to all of this. And so this extraction of resources um, affects all natural resources, but the defense of land and seeds is particularly important. And um, you know, agriculture has a direct impact on climate change, both animal agriculture, industrial agriculture. So there's a direct impact, but also an indirect impact because through the um, appropriation of land and seeds by large interests like this, we're also moving more people into working into other industries that are also harmful. So there's both a direct and indirect effect of what's happening with agriculture on climate change. So like I'm sure almost everybody who's at Soil Not Oil, Seed the Commons is basically against this model, this, eco this economic model. We're fighting against it. We want to reclaim the commons, protect seeds, protect seed sovereignty, because that's what's driving a lot of the problems. And um, we believe that our food system should be, you know, in, in as far as agriculture goes, um, should be transitioned away from industrial farming towards agroecological practices. So our main project, or one of our main projects, has been to organize the People's Harvest Forum. We've done it three years so far. And it's a forum, it's a, over three days where we explore the consequences, both social and environmental, mostly social so far, of the corporate takeover of food systems and how agroecology um, you know, should be and can become the basis of a better food system. So, Seed the Commons is a vegan organization from an ethical standpoint, so we include that in the same way that we don't want to um, you know, promote racism or sexism, so we include animals in our moral compass. And so, as such, at the People's Harvest Forum, um, while not all of the speakers that we invite are vegan, the farmers that we invite to speak are vegan. And so, um, you know, we have panels where people speak about agroecology, or they'll talk about their permaculture project somewhere in the U.S. And it so happens, therefore, that the agroecology, the permaculture that they're talking about is a vegan application of these ideas. And so that's been a totally revolutionary project within the food movement because it goes against what others are doing. And so basically what's happening in the rest of the movement is that um, you know, animals, farm animals, tend to be a very central part of this idea of sustainability, um, traditional systems, agroecology. And I think that this is something that goes beyond the movement and is just common in our culture, where when we start talking about these things that we all agree on, like, you know, we need to move away from GMOs or pesticides and farm differently, um, in our culture, those ideas tend to get equated with the backyard chickens, the, you know, the cow grazing. And this imagery that is so potent in our culture comes from Eurocentrism, in my opinion, and in turn it reinforces it, and it enforces a certain idea that um, it's not just that it's fine to have these animals, the idea that is conveyed is that it's necessary to have them. And so I don't have time for a large you know, historical sort of um, tangent, but there is a history to this where farm animals were brought to the Americas, or to North America by, um, uh, you know, settlers, and not only did they bring the cows, the pigs, the chickens, but the advancement of ranching specifically was a major component and driver of colonization. So in my opinion, culturally, that's one of the reasons that it's something that is so valued today. 
but ecologically it also has very strong impact. So I'll let you go ahead and read this from the book Ecological Imperialism. So some conservationists um, speak of uh, cattle as being an invasive species. So basically, um, what nobody really disagrees about, the disagreement is more in present day aspects, but pretty much everybody agrees that when farm animals were brought to the Americas, they did have a strong impact on um, native ecosystems and were in conflict uh, with native wildlife. So, when we hear about this, which we don't often enough, it's always in the past tense. Like, you know, yes, the cows are brought and Europeans killed the bison or, you know. Um, but we don't realize that this is present day stuff as well. And so we have direct impacts of ranching on wildlife, such as wildlife services killing wild animals to protect the profits of ranchers. But we also have the uh, sort of uh, non-intended effects. Um, like loss of habitat because of, you know, one animal taking it over. Um, and even in the Bay Area, um, you know, there's a huge popularity of things like local meat, local milk, um, you know, Strauss, Clover, these sorts of companies that off offer uh, organic milk. The, the, the marketing of it is truly based on this idea of stewardship of the land and the idea that these are local farms that come from Marin County and therefore that's a very um, positive thing for our environment. And so the pictures always have this pastoral imagery of the old McDonald's farm as, as a selling point. But in Marin County, we actually have a conflict between organic, not, you know, it's not the big bad, you know, factory farms, it's the small scale organic dairy farms where the native tule elk are dying off because of conflict over water and fencing to protect um, the, the profits of ranchers. So I just illustrate this to show that these things are actually present day and they're also local to us. Now, um, I'm sure everybody has heard about regenerative grazing, and for me it's been very interesting to sort of think about the, the narrative, the vocabulary used, and compare that with the past um, of, uh, of the history of ranching um, in the United States, because it echoes this idea of, um, you know, when, when I said that ranching was sort of central to the colonial project, there was the idea of manifest destiny, where the advancement of European agriculture was um, something that was not only uh, allowed and that settlers were not only entitled to, but in fact it was something that was bringing this land to its full potential. And so we have this idea again of going and healing and saving, and this is the thing that's going to save us. But you know, what's interesting is that often one of the arguments for that is that native herbivores have disappeared and so cows are the next best bet. But what that hides is that a lot of the conflicts that existed in the past are ongoing and that in many cases these herbivores actually are still here. And so we're not talking about that in this conversation. So every year, for example, in Yellowstone there's a bison cull in Marin County. We have the native tule elk that are disappearing. Um, in regard specifically to the idea of eating or growing plant-based, one of the things we hear is, well, no, that doesn't make sense. Grazing is a necessity because a sort of a healthy ecosystem has animals and um, plants. But that's a bit of a misleading argument because nobody is saying that ecosystems shouldn't have animals. What's happening here is that we're saying we need to have one type of animal um, and implying that if we don't bring, for example, cows, that there wouldn't be any other animals. When in fact, what's often the reality on the ground is that other animals, such as coyotes, such as bison, such as tule elk, such as you know gophers or whoever, are being killed to make way for the animals. So I'm here with one veganic farmer, somebody else who's studying the movement. We just spent a whole weekend with veganic farmers. And so it's important to understand that veganic farming, it's a bit of a broad term, for lack of a better one. Um, but all of these things that are talked about um, can be done within a framework that doesn't include farm animals. And it's important to um, you know, counter this, this false um, idea that veganic farmers would want to you know, create ecosystems without animals. Um, one of the farmers that I know says that what he wants is to create voluntary relationships, spaces where actually wildlife is more um, 
more welcome. So instead of having honeybees, they're going to create habitat for many varieties of native bees and other pollinators. Um, so we hear these days a lot about regenerating the soil, sequestering carbon through soil, and so on. And um, that's not something that you know, it's an either or. We can work with those ideas within systems that are veganic, but I also want to um, mention the, the forests. Uh, we're not hearing so much about forests anymore, I feel. I mean, I saw that this week there are a couple events on deforestation, but um, not many RSVPs. <laughs> But we used to hear a lot about forests, and so one of the advantages of transitioning um, towards plant-based agroecological practices would also be just giving back some of the land for reforestation and stopping some of the deforestation that's going on. So um, in terms of what's happening, we've been organizing the People's Harvest Forum uh, since 2015. We've also been doing a lot of gardening workshops, things like that. Um, and I thought this was very interesting because veganic is not something that's very well known, even within farming communities. And I saw this on Twitter literally two days ago. And what was so interesting to me is that here the guy says the uncertainties and potential shortcomings of veganic farming was the very first time, you know, there's always this back and forth um, between plant-based, no, but we need, you know, the meat. Um, and I had never seen veganic farming mentioned explicitly in sort of a counter argument, so that shows that it is something that is growing and becoming visible. This was us two days ago on Saturday in San Francisco. Um, I am not a farmer myself, so I marched behind the banner. The banner was being uh, carried by veganic farmers from Canada, from Vermont, from Oregon, from California. And um, yeah, basically we marched with this idea that agriculture has to be part of the conversation. I'm sure everyone agrees here throughout Solnod Oil. Agriculture has to be part of the conversation on climate change, and it's important to transition away from both industrial and animal agriculture, and it's possible it's not a either-or situation. Um, so I really think that the people, the farmers who are already working on this already have solutions that the rest of us should be listening to and lifting up their voices. So I'm going to stop talking. Um, Mona is going to speak a bit about what's going on with the veganic farming movement in the US, and then we actually have a farmer who can tell us more of what it is we're talking about. Thank you. Hi, my name's Mona. Um, I'm up here from Los Angeles. I'm at Loyola Marymount University. Um, I've been studying and also organizing with the veganic farming movement in the US for maybe three years now. I actually first learned about veganic farming through um, Nassim's People's Harvest Forum in, I think it must have been late 2015, if that was your first one. Yeah, so um, that was a big impact on my own life, my own professional trajectory. Um, and I've been working on a research project around the US veganic movement with Alicia Utter, who will be our third speaker, um, who's representing the farming community as well as the research community. Um, so today I'm going to give a, a quick overview of um, some ideas about the status of the veganic farming movement in the United States and then talk briefly about um, challenges that veganic farmers are, are facing, pretty briefly though. Um, and this, uh, what I'll share with you today is based on field work that Alicia and I have been conducting um, since earlier this year and also some preliminary work and organizing work since 2016. So, um, I kind of like to start talking about the status of the movement in terms of how many veganic farms we have in the U.S. and where they are. Um, so, map form works for me. I am trained as a geographer. And um, over the past couple years of some intensive Google searching and some um, snowballing, some word of mouth, I've been able to identify approximately 45 veganic farms currently in operation in the United States. And when I say farm, um, that term is used rather loosely. I know the USDA um, has a cutoff of um, $1,000 or more from sales. Here, some of these farms um, are maybe selling $400 a year. They're just getting off the ground with um, farm stands or something like that. And then all the way up to um, selling tens of thousands of dollars of veganic produce. So it's really a range here in terms of dollar amount. That said, I would say they are um, pretty much all uh, small farms in the financial sense. Um, we 
or I would also say that there's a possibility that this is a substantial undercount. One of the things that I have noticed in searching for veganic farms is that not every farmer who is veganic has even heard of that term, so they may not be using it. Some of them may be using a UK term such as vegan organic or stock free organic, so I can search for that, that's fine. Um, I've learned that some people are calling themselves vegan farms rather than veganic farms, so a simple um, reconfiguration of, of the search, of outreach. Um, and then some people who seem to not be attaching any of those words to their operation, perhaps out of fear of, of stigma. Um, the word vegan on your market stall or on your website may not play well in some regions, um, or that's uh, what they seem to be thinking there. Mm -hmm. So this could be um, an undercount of farms that are operating at any um, commercial or market scale in the US. Uh, most of these farms are diversified, um, diversified fruit and veggie operations. I know of one that does dates only, and we have some of the dates back there, in fact, from them. Um, I can think of one that has um, a rice uh, veganic field, like a rice monoculture, and then one in the Midwest that is a soy monoculture. But for the most part, veganic farms in the U.S. do appear to be diversified. And that's different from Canada, that has a lot more um, low diversified or undiversified like grain type farms and at a much bigger scale. Um, in terms of acreage, these are mostly um, quite small scale farms. I don't think that in the study that Alicia and I are doing, we have anybody who's bigger than 10 acres um, and that's kind of characteristic across the board as far as I've been able to tell. And many um, or all seem to be family farms owned by individuals. I can think of one that's a co-op, um, but we don't seem to have any corporate veganic farms operating in the United States. So this is all like small scale um, family uh, or individual operations. So an overview of what um, we tentatively know about veganic farms in the US. Um, I also like to compare this to the U.S. organic movement. I think it's really instructive to think about where we've been in terms of another movement that was ecological in nature. Um, and so I put some numbers at the top of the slide. We're a small group rather close to the slide, so I'm hoping you can see all the numbers. 45 veganic farms, not a big number. Um, it especially pales right now in comparison to over 14,000 um, certified organic farms in the US, and then our total number of 2.1 million farms operating in the United States. Um, so one of the things that I've been doing over the past couple of years is trying to talk to um, longtime organic farmers, um, some of whom now grow veganically, and asking these people who came up in the organic movement and where the veganic movement is in comparison to the organic movement. So um, most of the folks with whom I've spoken have said veganic is where organic was about 40 or 50 years ago. I think I heard 30 from one person, but most people are saying, oh, you know, it's veganic right now, our movement is where organic was 40 or 50 years ago. Um, and to qualify that further, some of the things that they've told me um, are some of the points on the slide. So this time period for the organic movement, 40-ish um, years ago, was when there was not um, a, an agreed upon definition of organic. That goes for veganic right now. Alicia and I are hearing definitions across the board of what veganic means to people. So there's a similarity there, not total consensus on what the term means. And the average American was not familiar with the term organic 40 or 50 years ago. Certainly the average member or the average person walking down the street may not have heard the term veganic. And the only people farming organically around that long time ago um, were small acreage farmers. They were um, kind of on the fringe, they were idealistic, and that also sounds characteristic of veganic farmers today. Um, I just talked to someone who was saying, you know, it's, it's really at that point in time for organic, it was really hard to learn about other organic farms. He was trying to figure out about 40 years ago where he could learn organic methods, like where, who could he go work for? And um, the way that he described that was um, similar to veganic right now. Um, I put together this map 
the other the other year. Um, on, on the slide that we just looked at, I published that map um, in January of this year through Seed the Commons website. Um, and that's my first attempt to get actually kind of a list or a compilation of veganic farms out there to expand on some of the existing lists of veganic farms that have been published. Um, uh, this was also a time in the organic movement that um, there was not a whole lot of policy and research support for organic. Um, mostly that sounds right for veganic. And also at this time, there were questions about whether um, organic was viable. So I'm not sure how to make this disappear, but the bottom word, the word here is yields. Questions about viability slash yields. Um, if the yields are high enough, is this a form of farming that is tenable? Can you support yourself? That sort of question. Um, and I would say that um, maybe veganic is doing better at this point in time than organic was at its point in time. Um, one of the reasons I say that is there's a small research literature from the UK that indicates yield comparability. And also the Rodale Institute has been running, um, as part of its 30-year trial, one of their uh, plots, their organic legume plot, is in fact a veganic plot. And the results that have been coming out um, over the past couple decades from that study indicate comparability between their organic animal-based plot and their organic legume plot in terms of yields and other measures, okay? So um, a little bit maybe ahead of the curve we could say that in terms of veganics. I also want to remark on one other possible hallmark of, um, in the progress of a farming movement, which is um, farmers associations. So we had an event yesterday for veganics and this came up. Um, there are no regional or national veganic farmers associations in the United States. Forty years ago, we did have such associations for organic farmers. CCOF had formed by then, um, I believe NOFA had formed by then, Rodale had been around for um, a little while before those. Um, so the lack of a veganic farmers association or another organization that's dedicated to supporting veganic farmers means um, that nobody is paid or dedicated to supporting farmers with things like um, networking opportunities and educational opportunities like conferences. Um, anything that's going on in that realm is actually probably put on by Nassim's organization, which is not dedicated to veganics, but that's one of the um, topics that her organization cares about. Um, we don't have an association to serve as kind of a clearinghouse for news and for information that's germane to veganics. Um, an association could manage a veganic certification program. Uh, the folks who did Certified Naturally Grown um, actually did have a veganic certification in the U.S. maybe around 2010, but it no longer exists. I'm told because of interest, but um, a Veganic Farmers Association could look into a certification program and managing it. Um, and also a, a certification, or excuse me, um, an association would also do advocacy on behalf of veganic farmers and veganic agriculture in the policy realm. So um, I'm thinking some of you here today are farmers and I don't need to explain to you what a farmers association would do, but it's important to note that um, 40 years ago, the organic movement did have an association base and right now um, at Veganics at this point in time, we don't. Uh, so this kind of ties into my last slide um, to share a, an idea about um, a challenge that veganic farmers are facing. Um, so this idea of, of support, supporting organizations, etc., really links into something that Alicia and I have heard farmers articulating, which is the difficulty of getting guidance on um, soil and plant health that's compatible with a veganic approach and also the difficulty of getting assistance with um, herbivore management, whether that be birds or mammals or insects, that's consistent with a vegan ethic in your farming. Um, so some of our participants have talked about turning to fellow farmers or to extension agents and asking how can I um, build my soil in a veganic way? How can I um, deal with my mountain beaver in a veganic way and um, getting answers that are certainly satisfying and helpful to organic farmers but not to um, their own veganic farmership. So 
Mark in North Carolina and Bonnie up in Oregon. I provide some quotes from um, our, our study to, to show you some of what we're hearing about the, in, the difficulties with getting um, technical information that is veganic in nature. Um, and really the bigger picture here is that the level of technical support for veganic farmers in the U.S. is quite low. Um, as Bonnie's quote indicates, we don't have um, veganically trained extension agents. Um, we don't have a repository of like region-specific, climate-specific, soil-specific veganic techniques or best practices. Um, maybe more on the front end, we don't have formal um, education opportunities in veganics in as far as you cannot take university courses, you cannot take um, extension courses or certification programs. There are in a couple places around the U.S. Um, farmers or um, similar organizations, like very small grassroots organizations that will run um, a week or several weeks long of training programs. So you could learn veganics like from a farmer, but that's much different than having veganics institutionalized at an education um, organization like um, a land grant university or something. Um, so the time that, that veganic farmers spend um, navigating some of these difficulties, the time that they spend doing the research, um, googling questions, trying to find sources and translating them into a, a veganic um, appropriate method can be prohibitive. Um, so the technical support piece here is really key in terms of supporting farmers and especially new farmers, people who are hitting the ground running in veganics um, and who don't have a wealth of knowledge to draw on. They haven't been farming organically for 10 years and can't just translate what they were doing and use um, their, their history with farming to help themselves in their veganic approach. Um, the last thing I'll say is that I named the slide Veganic Specific Challenges because I want to acknowledge there are, of course, challenges that are specific to farming veganically. The technical support angle would be one, um, sourcing veganic amendments would be another, but veganic farmers also face many of the same challenges that any small-scale ecological farmers in the U.S. face. Um, for instance, land access and land tenure, um, having to balance farming with um, off-farm employment, these questions of um, sustaining oneself, being resilient. And to me, this means that as veganic farming expands, um, seeing non-veganic uh, farmers, non-veganic ecological farmers as, as allies, um, seeing um, non-veganic ecological movements as movements to organize with um, may be an important part of the path forward just as much as um, getting a better level of veganic specific support um, out there for these folks. So hopefully I have not taken up too much time. That's it for me. Alicia, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you. Everyone. I need to go ahead and shut this if you're all set now. Great. So I'm going to rely on this terrific, fantastic, dramatic background behind me. Um, just to get a feel for who's with us today, is anyone a grower either identifying as a gardener or a farmer? Terrific. Is anyone vegetarian or, or vegan amongst us? Great. Wonderful. Um, so just to give some context, I am sharing one narrative today, but I want to acknowledge that there's a diverse um, set of voices within the veganic movement. So where I'm coming from is I'm a beginning farmer in Grand Isle, Vermont. It's on the Lake Champlain Islands adjacent to Lake Champlain. And what I grow is things ranging from gooseberries to currants, red, pink, white, and black, uh, aronia, and, uh, messing around with some pawpaws, strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, a really diverse uh, selection of fruit that I sell direct to consumer and also in a line of value-added products. I do currently grow uh, veganically. And then as Mona has alluded to, I'm also a PhD student and I'm in my fourth year um, working on my plant and soil science doctorate at the University of Vermont with my dissertation being in veganic farming. So this touches on various aspects of my life. So where I came to in veganic farming was I participated in a farmer training program on the East Coast. And one of my tasks was to spread blood meal within one of the hoop houses. Does anyone smell blood meal? I'm getting some nods from audience members. It was suggested I wear a mask and I'm looking at the bag 
And I'm in this framework that was, that was posed as, all right, we're going to work on an agriculture or an agroecology that's good, right? Let's bear with me on this binary oversimplified reference. But okay, we're going to do something that's really good, but the bad prevailing system of agriculture is over here. And what I recognized in that moment is that we really function on the margins of one another. That blood meal was scraped off of a slaughterhouse floor where there was both conventional and organic, perhaps, animals that went through. It was from an industrialized system that I did not in line with, both that as a vegan, but as someone who saw, saw myself as a food justice advocate. And I was really uncomfortable in that moment. So when I finished the program, I, had, I was in a position where I was able to lease some land for annual vegetable production at the time. And that specific parcel of land had been farmed since 1870. So I found myself, how am I going to, to feed this land? It was a short-term lease. So I only had a, a handshake deal getting me on that land for one year. So I knew that there were tools like cover crops and green manures, but that wasn't going to do me any good for my first season per se. So I looked to bag plant-based fertility so that could be more aligned with my ethos and the ethics that I recognized. So I bought in the soybean meal and the alfalfa meal and the kelp meal, and it, it did well, right? I fed the plants, but I recognized in hindsight that I wasn't feeding the soil. So I'm in a very fortunate position today where I have um, land tenure, I have long-term land access on seven acres, which is tremendous, and I recognize the privilege in that because so many do not. And, and what that has allowed me to do is change my, my framework to a more agroecological lens. Think about how my practices today will perhaps benefit myself and the ecosystem a decade from now, several decades from now. So now I can incorporate more methods like green manures and uh, crop rotations and so on and so forth. But I also found that thinking about veganic, I came to it as an ethical vegan, right? I went vegan a decade ago. But there's so many other potential benefits and I'm hearing that amongst organic farmers and conventional farmers alike. I don't know if folks have heard, but there's FISMA, which is the Food Safety Modernization Act. It's the first major overhaul of the food uh, safety regulation since 1938 in the United States. And it's imposing these stricter standards on uh, farmers, especially around raw manure use. So I'll give you an example. So it's 90 days that you need to wait between applying raw manure to a crop that you're, you'll harvest, per se, the leafy greens on that. So you need to wait 90 days. Um, and then it's a, excuse me, I, I flip this around. It's 90 days if it's a crop where you harvest, so like a corn or, or, or berries. It's 120 days if it's leafy greens or something that you would consume directly. That's aligned with the prevailing organic standards in the United States. Now, I'm here sharing an East Coast perspective. What's challenging about that is I grow in a zone four. Our frost-free season is 120 days. So if I wanted to use manure and I applied it the very first day of the frost-free season, I wouldn't be able to plant in this hypothetical example until the very end of my season. Of course, there's means to get around that, right? Applying at the season's end. But then there's this other conversation happening regarding food safety and thinking about tracing those pathogen outbreaks that we're seeing in large-scale uh, greens operations especially, those are from um, animal and non-human animal uh, feces is really what it comes down to. When you trace that, the um, CDC has incredible fingerprinting where they can trace it to the animals that the manure is exposed to the field. So this is a food safety piece as well. And the last example I'll share is from my community in Vermont. We're currently having um, a, a crisis in our bodies of water due to phosphorus. And I don't know if folks have heard about what's going on in the East Coast or if it's relevant to your communities here, but we buy in a lot of grain to feed uh, our dairy um, industry in Vermont, and it's rich in phosphorus. So then in the cow manure, we have a tremendous amount of phosphorus and it's seen as this full package fertilizer. So it's really liberally applied across fields in Vermont. It then goes into the lake and causes eutrophication and incredible damage to the lake that I see when I visit because it's very close to us. So there's all of these different pieces and one aspect that I want to acknowledge that but I'm not going to go into depth is the human oppression piece, right? We know that there's a lot of food justice work surrounding conditions in slaughterhouses and what that looks like. 
So I do see veganic as a means not only as, okay, this is a means for animal liberation, there's so much more context here as to how we can recognize this as one tool in our toolbox for regenerative agriculture, right? So I want to call on folks both on the consumer end but also the grower end to see this and respect this movement as just one more option. Perhaps you live in a short growing season like myself. This is one more means. I'm seeing no, so maybe you have a long, a long growing season. Good for you. Um, but this is just one strategy around that, and I think it will help us all collectively create a more resilient food system moving forward, which is a goal of mine, and I hope you share it as well. So I want to leave a couple moments for questions and be respectful of everyone's time. So I'll open it up if that's okay. And Did you want to? Yeah. I, I really do have a question of what, what you shared and what you shared there is problem of the yeah, farming. Well, I'm a natural farmer. Yeah? So I, I make amendments and fertilizers from nature. Uh, in the natural farming, I would say we're 95% aligned with the yeah, yeah, farm. The only area we're different is in making fish amino acid. We, we take uh, uh, fish tails and, and break them down to, to fertilize. So, but if we take that part out, all the other amendments is all plant-based and it's all aligned with your style of farming. Uh, your issue with short-term crop, um, our, our application is all foliar. Yeah? Yep. So, so we make our, our plant amendments, uh, fermented plant juice, fermented fruit juice, and it's, the theory is plant back on plant. Whatever enzymes is in the plant, we put it back to encourage the growth of the plant. Uh, so, you know, I mean, if you want, I can visit with you folks and help you guys with your problem about, or just look up natural farming or Korean natural farming. Uh, and, uh, and primarily what we do is we hike them to the forest. So in Vermont, the closest forest you have to your seven acre land, mm -hmm. go in the forest and collect microbes. Mm -hmm. uh, you gotta think who fertilizes the forest. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The great one. And so obviously there's good stuff in there that you gotta bring up and put on the farm. Mm -hmm. The book Call right next to you. Yeah, the yeah. book right next to you, Will Bonsall's book, does touch on that. He really is an advocate of using that leaf matter as mulch and his weed suppression. Yes, yes, yes. And I, I want to make space for you all, but one anecdote there is that I, it was incredible to see diversified um, animal and plant farmers actually really take to veganics um, from folks that I've spoken with in the Vermont community, because although some of them were using their own um, slaughter byproducts, they were saying, after that, I don't want to support the industrial system either. That's what I've been working with him. He's been sort of very curious of like, oh, you know, I've been farming eight times for four years. It's not doing so well. And it's been all these different stories that, you know, we've been able to talk to him, and I know he's really curious about how can you improve this land. And then Kay on the other side, she also owns her land, and she's growing, this is her farm on the, on the top, and she's really well connected with NRCS, and in the back she has an orchard of like, four different fruit trees, and she has cover crops that she's been able to get um, uh, planted through a program in NRCS. And she's been able to she, uh, plant different crops through the years. And so these farmers by no means are typical, and one of those is because they own land. Um, but going back to the other farms, and I'm going to end here, is that a lot of these farms, these polyculture farms are providing these tons of food, are actually driving sometimes at 2 in the morning on a Friday and coming out to the Bay Area to your farmer's markets in the city, uh, to your farmer's market around the Bay Area, and they're actually selling their crops here because there's more access to different markets. And some of them, not farms I've worked with, um, an extension agent um, told me, have passed away because they had to wait uh, on the road and they've crashed because they had to come on so far. And so some of the things I think about in terms of you know, improving soil health in the Summer Green Valley is much more than just ecological, but also it has to be policy driven and uh, socially driven. So some of the possible solutions that I um, like thinking about is one, as I mentioned, some of the barriers to be able to sort of take on these practices, one, that there's not actually equitable access to incentives. 
So there's a lot of, you hear about a lot of these like, you know, poster child stories of organic farms or, you know, like sinking frogs earlier. A lot of these farms are actually able to have a better access to these programs because they're well connected to different networks of researchers and uh, extension agents. Um, I also um, want to imagine the soil health training programs that actually uh, address like the backgrounds of the farmers. And lastly, and then the other, the other last thing is that land access and land tenure is crucially important for small scale farmers, including the farmers I'm working with across California. There's so much corporate buyout of large expenses of land, and I think it's important that we want to move towards you know diversifying farms and improving soil health. That that's at the center. Right. Thank you. Again, my name is Jeff Borm. I am from the East Stanislaus Resource Conservation District. I will really quickly explain, if y'all don't know what a resource conservation district is, um, they are around California in each and every county. Um, we are this local entity that works with all the community, but often focus on agriculture with farmers and ranchers, um, and looking to find solutions for folks within those communities. Uh, we are, we have, different ones have different tax bases. We have a whopping $3,000 per year. That'll get you a whole lot of bubble gum, but not much else. Um, uh, and then from there, uh, everything else is grant. Uh, so everything I do is grant-based. I am housed out in Modesto, uh, as I believe Kevin said. Uh, however, all my grants take me statewide. And so I'm, I feel very lucky uh, to, be able to look at California from a, a fairly comprehensive uh, perspective, getting to travel all around it, all around it. Um, this is just a pretty tree. All my pictures, they're just going to be pretty pictures. I don't have the research that they do. I don't do the research they do. I do work with researchers. I, I coordinate some compost field trials. Um, I coordinate some cover crop trials around the state. I do workshops around the state, I work on riparian restoration plans, I also uh, speak in front of the legislature and attempt to educate them. That's probably the least favorite part of my job. Um, go figure. But that's okay. I still think uh, it can be important. Um, working on the state, federal levels, international levels is very important. But what I'm here to talk to you about today is the Great, thank you for joining us. So this was a kind of impromptu breakout session designed at the last minute. Um, my name is Natasha Florentino. Um, I directed a documentary film called Abundant Land, Soil, Seeds, and Sovereignty. And it follows the story of a group of Hawaiian residents on the island of Molokai as they work to oppose the biotech industry's work um, on that particular island. And the film also talks about how GMO seeds have been planted and tested on throughout the Hawaiian islands. And I didn't realize it, but um, we have a special guest from Maui who's actually a county council member who was intimately involved with one of the biggest fights against the GMO seed industry. Um, that was the passing of a moratorium against GMO seeds. So um, we may be able to show the trailer if they can figure out the, the tech around that. But in the meantime, I just want to pass around the postcard to the film so you all can learn a bit more about it. They can go on the film's website if they want to pass it on. Um, and I would like to just introduce Alika Atai. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about um, which biotech companies are currently operating in Maui? Okay. Uh, uh, or have been operating in Maui? I'll, I'll address that. Uh, yeah. But before I can begin this uh, talk story, I want to uh, welcome the rest of my ancestors mm -hmm. as they do come from Maui, Hawaii. Um, so, uh, the door will be open. In Natua, naive Otomotu. No, no. The door can be open because the family needs to come. In Natu Puna, Tu Puna Kahiko, Mau Yokama. In Natua, Mau Yokama. 
We beckon our ancestors to join us. We beckon our grandparents, our great-grandparents. We beckon our ancestors of the past. We also beckon the bones of the, the islands to join us because uh, I stand not alone. I speak for them, with them. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Alika Atai, and I'm from the island of Maui, Hawaii. Uh, why I stand here, uh, I was part of the audience in this Soil Not Oil conference. Uh, uh, primarily, I, I traveled from Maui to come and listen to uh, Vandana Shiva, uh, because she came to our island about three or four years ago and visited with us. But the also intention was to address uh, agroecology, soil remediation, uh, carbon sequestration, and thinking, looking for solutions. Uh, so I stand here not only as a uh, uh, indigenous Native Hawaiian, but I also stand here as a practicing natural farmer uh, that grows food. Uh, with interest, I, I was following the presentation previous to me about veganic farming, and uh, we're very similar, very similar. You know, we, we do our natural farming by first collecting microbes from the inner forest, and uh, the secret of that is producing and mass producing uh, be beneficial fungi. We find that beneficial fungi comes from the source of wood or trees or mushrooms that comes out of the forest. Uh, and we bring those uh, uh, leaf litter from the forest and uh, fungi from the forest and we will then uh, exponentially multiply them and transition them into uh, working amendments and soil solutions. Because the secret of growing food is connected to the health of your soil. So I stand not only as an indigenous person, not only as a farmer, but I also currently stand as a political representative on a county council of Maui. Uh, was elected in that two years ago, currently in another re-election attempt. But my story I stand here today is how I got here and what, what it involves. And so if any of you are community organizers, organizing events or causes, this is a story about community organizing. If you're a person that supports the anti-GMO movement, this is a story about the movement. Uh, so I'll take you back to around year 13, 2013. Uh, I, I received a phone call from a group asking me to be one of the five citizens that would initiate a citizen's initiative ballot or ballot initiative and what that required was uh, uh, to get 20 percent of your electorates uh, registering on a petition to ask that a ballot be placed onto the charter election vote to eliminate genetic engineering methods and the current uh, GMO practices that was occurring on the island of Maui, in particular in Maui County. Uh, in particular on Maui, uh, the chemical company that was doing this genetic engineering was Monsanto. And for me, uh, I always call them that because of their practices and their ways of killing our aina, killing our land, polluting our waters, and affecting the health and welfare 
of our children and our kupuna, our elders. Being concerned. And so when this group gave me a phone call, uh, they tried to spend 15 minutes trying to convince me to say yes. But I knew what the answer was. Uh, and so with that, I, I said, okay, I will lead the charge. Wow. With that, it took me on this journey, on a crazy journey about asking people to register themselves to vote because many have been against the system of voting. You need to understand the people that live there, especially the Hawaiian people, have been oppressed not for one generation, not for two generations, not even for three generations, but they've been oppressed for almost four generations. And through that time, you would have to also recognize and understand that they acquired, or we have acquired, an attitude of apathy. And what for? Why get involved? Why participate and vote? And I had to convince many that that is why. That is why we need to exercise that right to vote. Because if we are not present, we are not actively in involved, we are not engaged and at the table, we will just continue to be on their menu. So with that, I, I took on the task of motivating the populace of trying to get them to understand why. It was a difficult task because the island was controlled by corporations with a lot of money and power and the agrochemical companies that were strongly entrenched in our island community from the plantation era and the plantation mentality which carried forward amongst the community. You know, a lot of fear of going up against the big plantation corporation from the pineapple industry, sugar industry, and now genetic seed industry. Very powerful. But my cause and my cry to them was, there's a difference of people that reside on the island. Some of us live here, and some of us just sleep here. And I called and plead to those who say that they live on the island. And I say, if you live here, then this is your home. And we must protect our home. And that is why we need to rally. We need to unite. We need to lock arms and exercise that right to vote. So it's a large task because we had to register some 12,000 some odd number to get to have a petition so that that, that vote could be placed onto the election ballot. It was a different approach. And so what we did was we had a lot of donations from people, a lot of volunteers from people, and they went door to door, getting people who never voted or who used to vote and gave up voting for like 10 years to re-register, to get engaged. And so we were able to meet that deadline. In fact, we know we had the amount, the valid amount of signatures. We turned it into the clerk's office. They come back and say, oh, only half is good. So we didn't argue. We could have spent a week or so arguing and going over name by name, you know, to verify whether they're a, a bona fide voter. We turned around, walked out the door, and went back into the streets, re-registering and continuing 
getting people registered. We finally figured, okay, we got enough legal names, turned it in again, and we made the official count. And there the county clerk said, okay, you've, you've completed the, this phase, now you need to win the election. And so on the ballot, it was a vote yes. The vote yes to, to correct the genetic engineering activities and the GMO production. A lot of folks talk about anti-GMO or GMO. My involvement was more about against the genetic engineering methods that they were doing and implementing with the heavy concentrated uses of chemicals. And they were bombarding and spraying these chemicals onto these plants to change and alter the genetic composition of these plants. But along that process, doing that engineering method, they also would be dousing our island, our soil, with these chemicals. For fear, I said, you know, these lands, these farmlands where Mount Satan's farms were located, were at an elevation of 40 feet, 50 feet above sea level. You know, so if you understand the percolation and, and if you put chemicals onto your plants, goes onto the soil, little bit of rain come, it, it'll push that chemical further down. Eventually, it can and could reach your water aquifer. On Maui, our primary water aquifer sources are what we call a basal lens. So the water is located just underneath the coral reef, which is at zero elevation. Yeah? It's not if, it's when that chemical would reach our aquifer and possibly taint our future drinking water sources for, not for me, but for future generations, those who are yet to be born. We have responsibilities, not only to take care of ourselves today, we also have responsibilities <clears throat> to take care of this place we live for future generations, that they would have good drinking water. And that's why I stood up, you know, to stop the genetic engineering method. What they were doing, okay, this is a crazy story. One of our guys, uh, a group of our guys were um, monitoring the cornfields of Monsatan. And they got through the bushes and got up to the property line and they took a picture of a spray board. At the end of all the fields, uh, they would have uh, like a, a four by eight plat, um, uh, board, which would have every day what they were spraying. Day one, eight chemicals. Next day, eight chemicals. Next day, eight more chemicals. Next day, eight more chemicals. Every day, they would be spraying different an amount of chemicals. So you can't only look at what that one chemical was on that one day, you have to understand in a two week period, what is the exponential amount? Eight times eight times eight times eight times eight. What is the chemical compound that you're making? So it, it's a, I don't know, one in a trillion uh, con configuration, you know, that you're going to come up with. It's crazy. But they didn't know it when they took a picture and they brought it back to us and we shared it with our, our scientist friends. They also said, one of the guys circled one of the chemicals. He said, this chemical is a nerve agent that is totally outlawed and illegal to have 
And so I'm saying, okay, so they're spray, spraying these chemicals into our air, yeah, inundating the health of our air with chemical poisons. And those chemical poisons will drift in the air. We have very good trade winds that always blow. Where their farms are located are just upwind from the schools and senior centers. So these, the unknowing, and oh yeah, by the way, just upwind from some of the hotels and condominiums, you know, that our visiting tourists stay at. So a lot of, un, uh, a lot of visitors and tourists of Maui unknowingly are also being exposed to this chemical drifts. That's just in here. And then they're dousing the land, possibly tainting and nearly tainting our water source. And then I'll take you back specifically to December 2006, January 2007. Then I was a canoe coach teaching high school kids on the beach on outrigger canoe paddling. But in December of 2006, we had a big storm, big rain, rain storm. It said it just flooded all the fields, all the farms got flooded, all the chemicals got saturated and seeped into our stream beds. And those stream beds went all the way down into our beach, our ocean. I, we trained there with the kids in that ocean. For 10 days, the State of Hawaii Department of Health person would come every day, test it in the morning, test it in the afternoon, and I'd check in with them, is it safe? First day, you smelled chemical in the water. Second day, you smelled chemical with dead fish in the water. Third day and fourth day, you just smelt rotting flesh. Yeah, because all the chemicals killed everything that was on the reef. Every day, I waited for the results and they said no good. So I couldn't let the kids, for the safety of protecting the kids, I didn't let them go into the ocean and paddle and train. This is a 10 days straight. Every morning, every afternoon, they tested wasn't good. So we fast forward to 2013 when I got chosen to lead the charge uh, for this uh, uh, anti-GMO movement. The movement was called Shaka. S-H-A-K-A. -A. Yeah. Uh, sustainable Hawaiian agriculture for the keiki and the aina. Shaka. And so we engaged the community and, and we, we were running through the community, getting the initiatives, it got on the ballot. Now it was just like a political campaign, like Shaka, the ballot <coughs> initiative was a candidate. And we had to go house to house, convincing them to vote yes. Had to go island to island, community to community, we did rallies, we did marches, we did um, dinners, we had many talks and, and along the way as, as much it was a grassroots effort of the community to awaken themselves, to be engaged and, and push forward. So as much as our effort was going in that direction, Monsatan's effort was to also market and advertise they would be running newspaper ads, they would have flyers and postcards, they would have TV commercials. Um, they spent on record, because they had to report it in a campaign spending report, close to $8 million. You know, they spent close to $8 million in that marketing campaign uh, to, to educate everyone to vote no. And we were on the other side educating everyone to vote yes. 
I say on record because we know that there is probably others that got paid. We heard rumors that others, I think there were five of them, that all got brand new uh, pickup trucks, fully decked because they needed their faces on camera to say they support Mont Satan. Uh, the end result, well not the result, but the vote, the people were victorious. We got over 23,500 people to vote yes. We soundly defeated uh, Monsatan and all the rest of the uh, GMO folks. And that was for everyone a true David versus Goliath uh, event. I remember my daughter we were uh, in the middle of the marketing and, and we participated in the county fair. You go to the county fair, you know, they have the county fair parade and you have those little wagons. Well, they had us, you know, my, myself and my, my son and my daughter on this little wagon float and we're waving at everyone, you know, encouraging everyone to vote, vote yes. And right behind us was this giant I don't know how many horse, giant John Deere tractor hauling a trailer of all the workers. So it was like maybe two, three hundred workers of the genetic fields all, all marching in the parade. And my daughter turned to me, she goes, Dad, do you know that this is like a David versus Goliath? I said, yeah. She goes, look at how many people they've got. Yeah. She goes, but then I said, oh, but do you know how the story ends? <laughs> and so on the night when we were victorious, we, the people, I praise the people, because the people believe in what is right. The people believe and know what we were saying. All the things we were saying about the, the carcinogenic nature of the glyphosate, carcinogenic nature of Roundup, you know, um, stopping chloropyrifos, atrazine in our waters, uh, all the, you know, and so we, we believe, and now, this is the vote in 2014. We are still, we're 2018, and now it's coming to fruition of a confirmation of everything that we were saying five years earlier, yeah? with the Monsanto lawsuit of, of uh, $289 million uh, jury uh, agreement uh, decision, that's a statement of what we were seeing all along. For me, like I said, it's the bombardment and the heavy use of chemical poisons onto our island, into the air, affecting potentially our water, and the health of our children and the health of our senior citizens who are already struggling on ventilators in senior homes and across the street upwind they're having to also be exposed to this poison uh, so that was the journey and the election was not continuation in two days our mayor and county council members joined Monsatan to file a lawsuit against our decision. So we go to court several months, although the, and to, to throw the vote out. The vote wasn't valid because they say that Maui County or those who have home rule do not have the power to exercise that law. So we challenged them, we fought them back, we went into state court, went to federal court, third circuit court, fought, challenged them, fought them back, appealed, and then it ends up in the ninth circuit court. And in the ninth circuit court, we all, you know, same, we, we stick in the battle. Along the way, we're having marches and trying to rally and encouraging people not to give up and the people want 
people know that the election won, but yet the system failed. And so the people were very heartbroken and discouraged on the system. But we prevailed, we went forward, we still decided, okay, let's go. Let's go all the way up to the Ninth Circuit Court. I was ready to go beyond the Ninth Circuit Court. I was okay going all the way to the Supreme Court, you know. Um, but the decision from the Ninth Circuit Court was still, you know, it wasn't the best decision, not the final decision, but it was a decision that was clear in two places. We, the people of Maui County, did not have the jurisdiction and power to control the use of chemical pesticides. It was the jurisdiction of the state of Hawaii. And so the state of Hawaii uh, is the one that can set the laws and set the controls of the uses of uh, pesticides and restricted use pesticides. Uh, the second part was they did give the county of Maui an opportunity to control GMOs via land use zoning. So eventually we could determine where they can do their GMO farming. Uh, currently, the situation, okay, so that, that went down. So the second half of the story is, it didn't just end with the vote. It didn't just end with a decision from the courts. The second half of the story is, I was encouraged to run for office, to make change, to be present in the political process. We needed to get our values of like-minded people, as the people, elected into office. So I ended up running for office for county council, and uh, I was victorious on that, and so was able to, for the last two years, participate in the county council from the policy legislative uh, angle. Now, to understand Hawaii, to understand Maui, and, and this is a message that, that I'd like to share with the rest of the folks in, in the Soil Not Oil Conference is that it's, you also need to engage and bring the legislative bodies to be present in this cause. Because to me, that is gonna be the quickest way of changing and moving the needle faster. So for us, the power of Maui is you need to get five. There's nine council members. If you control and acquire five council members, you have the majority, you then, and hopefully then, can follow through with the second half of that decision in the Ninth Circuit Court, but only until then. So right now, I'm a part of the minority party, and so no use to bring that up because I will always get voted down, uh, but the goal would be to have nine others running for office and hoping that we would achieve majority. On the state level, uh, it's a, a number of 13 on uh, state senators that we, if we can acquire 13 state senators aligned with your line of thinking, then you acquire power in the Senate body. Uh, in the state House of Representatives, that number is 26, yeah? So you need, you know, I mean, this is a formula and a template that I think every county uh, and every state must look at and to see who, just like that lady, uh, the last speaker yesterday, what she was talking about, she basically said who's with this movement and who is not with this movement in the various congressional offices. Uh, so that's very important. And, and, and it's just a matter of math. It's, it's about adding up the votes. Uh, so this is where we are today. You know, although we got defeated in court, we're just on pause. We didn't get totally defeated. We're just on pause. 
and to organize the community, to move the community forward. Uh, that's kind of like where we're at. We're, we're on the, the second half of the whole game. The game's not over. Uh, and so the movement of uh, anti-GMO, the movement of big corporations, uh, we stand, I stand uh, here on several issues. It's about environmental justice. It's about social justice and stopping oppression. And it's about cultural justice for us. Uh, so uh, that's my continuation of where we are at with the activities in Maui and in Hawaii. Uh, in regards to genetic uh, GMO farming. The other hat that I wear, like I shared, is that I am a natural farmer. And so uh, we need to encourage the information that there's alternative ways of growing food without using chemicals and pesticides. Uh, you know, uh, I, w I attended, as a member of the county council, I attended the statewide convention of counties. And this is a room full of county members, state senators, state representatives, and all these other governmental officials. And then I'm sitting in the audience and I find out who the sponsor of this event and conference was. It was Dow Syngenta and Monsanto. They sponsored this gathering. And on stage is a representative of the GMO industry saying that they have four curriculums of GMO industry for elementary schools. They have four curriculums of GMO education for middle schools. And they have two curriculums for high schools. And I sat in the audience and went, wow, they're that organized, that well-funded uh, to penetrate the minds of our kids. And I'm sitting in the audience and I'm saying, we need to counter. We need organic and natural farming education curriculums in the schools to show these kids how we can grow food. You know, the other guy's mantra or motto is, uh, we feed the world. And I said, yeah, but you forgot one word. Well. Aloha. So I don't know if you guys got any questions. of Hawaii. Hawaii is the only state that has a state constitution. Kind of unique. And in its constitution, Hawaii is the only state that has a public trust doctrine. And a public trust doctrine gives uh, the, the, the health of nature, the health of our environment, especially the water. Our water is uh, we have standing. And so it is through, through that public trust doctrine that the state must uphold. That's a state law by constitution. And so we're a unique, uh, we were, because of that unique structure, we have this very unique opportunity to, to stop this. But you guys gotta look at it. Why, okay, gotta back up, 85% of the world's GMO seed corn, 85% of the world's GMO seed corn comes from Maui. It's all grown there because we can get three to three and a half crops in one year. And they can move, move this genetic exchange. In, in three years, you can move 10, 10 generations forward, yeah? So, so the, the, the climate where we're at, and plus we're in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. 
So we become, the people, the natives of the island, and the children of this island, we become just like guinea pigs. You know, an experiment. You know, let's go douse this island, douse this group of people in the middle of the ocean with chemicals. Because they're assuming the drift will go out into the Pacific. You know, it's not gonna, you know. So I thought, wow, well, why don't you guys go do this in Oakland or in San Francisco? You know, nah. <laughs> they're not, right? They're going to do it out there because we are, in essence, telling us we are expendable. Yeah. Has the United States been able to continue their testing during this whole process? Yes, yes. So that hasn't been available? No. And what we're, we're doing, the citizens, the citizens, I'm still encouraging monthly testings of the waterways. And, and must monthly testing of the uh, the airs. So we, we have invested. We've also done uh, distributed, I don't know how many hundreds of vials of um, uh, urine testing for the residents, especially those that are downwind and exposed to kind of monitor uh, a lot of the women. Some of the issues that was in our the community, especially in Molokai and Yarp Park, was the um, gastroenthesis, yeah, where, where the babies were being, they're, they're, uh, at birth, the baby's stomachs were outside, yeah, so, and, and, and we had a handful of cases in one year, which is not normal, you know, like, like, that's like, you know, I, I don't know how many we had in Hawaii, I think it was seven in one year, which is like, maybe you get one out of you know, so that was like a uh, anomaly in that sense, saying that's not normal, right? Um, and so uh, high rates, um, high rates of um, uh, cancer rates and diabetes rates, and you know the, the, the medical issues is all aligned. They still go, yeah. You know, I mean, so it, it's quite evident that they are very large, they're able. Oh, I back up. You remember those reports that I told you the guy tested in 2006 and 2007 for 10 days, the Department of Health rep? Okay, so 2013, when I told the, the, our people about it, so I said, hey, we have evidence, you know, they, they go to the Department of Health records, nothing exists. Yeah. So I'm going to, I know it happened. I got 50 kids that can, are also witnesses to tell you that that happened. And they, it doesn't exist. Yeah. So, I mean, that's who we work with. That's who we got to move forward. Um, you know, we're, we're still on, on a community organizing part. We're in the heat of it. Our goal is to acquire the majority of uh, political control on our island so that we can determine our future and protect our island, protect where we live, protect our water sources, um, things like that. Yeah. Seed production, yeah. Yeah, production, yeah, in Maui County. And they, sh that's, that's, okay. <laughs> Gotta back up to it. The state of Hawaii's Department of Agriculture's budget, statewide budget, is 0.4% of the entire state. Not even one half of 1% is dedicated to agriculture. And of that 0.4%, only 10% is dedicated and focused on the production of food. So the greater majority of that 90% of that 0.4% all goes to support genetic seed production. So the investment, you know, they're, 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 they're entrenched uh, in our state government and corporations 
uh, they're very well entrenched. Um, and so we the people just need to be always on guard and motivated to, to look after our home. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing. Clearly you've done so much good work and I know there's more you want to keep doing, but uh, I'm just curious about you. It's, it's amazing what you've figured out. What, what was you think the hardest part of all this for you? Like, where was the, the hardest moment? Of, what got you through? It's, it's pretty impressive. Ah, God, that's a good question. Um, it, it's, a, it's a spiritual, spiritual connection. About eight years ago, my son back then was 28. He, he uh, lived in um, Hollywood and Las Vegas, and he was a VIP host in Vegas. So he was attached to, you know, making money and that lifestyle, but he got tired of it and he wanted to come home. And he was the one that had asked me that question of how come the Hawaiian people don't participate in the election process. And he was the one that told me, he said, when I told him, I said, well, you try to be oppressed, right? And he was the one that shared with me, he said, but don't they realize that to get out of oppression, you got to be engaged and actively participating in the process, and we got to get the people out to vote. That's the most powerful day that they have, that one day they're more powerful than everybody else by casting that vote. And so he was motivated, he said, I'm gonna come home and I'm gonna lead the people to do this. Well, a year later, he passed away, okay? So then now, then I get a phone call to get involved, you know? And so, um, I don't know if you can understand the spiritual realm, the realm of existence, of after mortal life, uh, but in our understanding, you know, we have what we call Ho'ailona, and Ho'ailona is uh, 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 signs of relationships with nature, and this is where the people of the spirit world, our ancestors, communicate with us through uh, transformations or, or through, uh, through forces of nature. And it is for us to pay attention what, they, what these signs are, what these ho'ailonas are. It can come to you in the wind. It can come to you in the rain. There's a thousand different kinds of wind. There's a thousand different kinds of rain. Some of you may have experienced a light, gentle breeze in the back of your ear. Yeah, that's them saying, I am here. The chirping of the birds, the, the rustling of the leaves, uh, uh, the moon bowl, double moon bowl, the triple moon bowl. Uh, when you see birds from the mountain hovering over you at the ocean, that's not normal. So when you see relationships in nature that is out of place, then you must also acknowledge their presence. A lot of times they will show up when you're at the toughest decision making in your life and they are there to support you in that decision. So many a times I've been there with their support. You know, and I know their presence. I know they're around and, and they guide me. There are times when, um, okay, that's the other thing is you gotta realize the message, but you gotta also master interpreting the message. So when the bird is going with me, then whatever I was thinking of doing, that's an affirmation. He's saying, yes, Dad, go. But when he's standing and going against me or flying the opposite direction, it's like, step on the brakes, don't even do it, you know? Or if he comes across me, it's like exercise caution. You know, sometimes I run into new people, I have new relationships, and I'm a trusting guy. But right after that, there's a swirl of wind, and then I see this bird going out. Oh, okay, let's, let's not get to know that person, you know? <laughs> and, and so that's what you asked me, why? Well, that's it. I, I know that we all have ancestors. 
and not only ancestors, but in this cause, we call ourselves Aloha Aina warriors. Those who are given the task or the responsibility to protect this land. And there's been many, many Aloha Aina warriors that have already passed on. And so you have to understand that these warriors are also doing battle up above us to pave the way for us on this mortal plane. You know, we, didn't, we don't just get here by ourselves. You know, so they're, they're always hovering around us. They're always joining us. Every day, we have new warriors helping the warriors in heaven. You know, and there, you know, we're, we're at many years again. This event has gone on for many years. Yeah, you just struggle along. And we hope that new, younger warriors will step forward and, and be able to receive the handoff and carry on. So it's, uh, it's for the future, you know. Uh, I, I share this to a lot of young kids. I share this where the message, if there's a way I can give a message. Our biggest goal in life, every one of you, your goal, my goal, everyone's goal in life is to become a great ancestor. Those who will be that judge of whether you are worthy of being recognized as a great ancestor are yet to be born. They will be born seven generations from now. And they will open the history book and look at it and say, oh, my great, 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 great grandfather, he was a scrub. He could have done some great things for us, but he never, right? Or they can open a book and say, I'm proud to know that, that my ancestor was a great ancestor. Just by, you know, so, so the responsibility I have, I, I'm currently right now on a county council, it's crazy that they appoint me to be the chairman of water. I'm the chairman of water and natural resources. And so I, I, my job is to look after the health of the forest and the trees because we live on an island and we gotta catch the rain clouds. And then I gotta look at the health of our streams and, and where our water is going and then who's diverting water and stealing water from from our, our streams and, and then the health of the land, the ag land, you know, so that we keep all the water onto our soil and not just let it flush out into the ocean. So, the, because we need to recharge our island to recharge the aquifer. So the biggest task I have is making sure every aquifer on my island is clean, healthy, and full so that I hand it off, just like how my ancestors 2,000 years ago took care of it and handed it off to my generation in a pristine state. I don't want to be the generation that failed and didn't hand it off in an even better state. So that's what drives me. Yeah. Lord, thank you.